many of you would like to be described as happy by the speakers at your funeral? We have almost a universal desire to be described as one who smiles and laughs easily. Happy is the ultimate compliment. But when I was 10, I attended a funeral where the word happy was not mentioned. It was for my grandmother, who had taken her life after battling mental illness for many years, a fact that was not discussed openly for a long time. 1985 was a confusing time for this fourth grader, who was also learning the song, happiness is two kinds of ice cream, in my rural elementary school. What was happiness? What did it look like? What did it sound like? Could I have told that grandma was not happy? On a basic level, we show happiness with our faces. Children smile an average of 200 times per day. Adult women smile an average of 62 times per day. And adult males, they lag behind at eight times per day. We want to say we're happy, but sometimes our faces don't get the memo. On a deeper level, what do our conversations say about our happy meter? Do the words we say give compelling evidence that we are happy? Are our souls smiling? For the past 20 years, as a magazine editor, community activist, and newspaper reporter, I've seen emotions ranging from grateful to embarrassed to unabashedly prideful to happy. My interviewees often smile during the interview, and sometimes they tell me that they're happy but I look for further evidence by studying the content of their stories so I can reflect their personality accurately in my writings. Now, statistically, the United States ranks 23rd on a list of happiest nations. Depression is up and satisfaction is down. As a professional listener of countless happy people, I've determined that happiness is a skill. Further, I've documented the five things that happy people talk about most. So consider this your crash course in how to have a happy conversation. First, happy people talk about their passions. Vern and Vance Law are a father-son duo. They both played professional baseball and then they coached the sport that they love. They have in common two passions that became the focus of our interviews and of our magazine article, baseball and fatherhood. In fact, when I knocked on the door to interview Vern, the older of the two, and a Cy Young Award winner for being the top pitcher in Major League Baseball, he was listening to a radio broadcast of his son, Vern, coaching a game. When I realized that I was interrupting something he was passionate about, I offered to come back. But he wanted to share his happy stories with me, his happy outlook on life. So we visited in his living room while his wife would pop in the doorway and give us the update on the score so he didn't miss anything. Between those score reports, Vern's happy conversation focused on his passion of sharing parenting advice. For example, he believes that fathers, especially professional athletes, should spend their free time with their wives and their children rather than on the golf course that he saw many of his baseball colleagues do. He also said that it's less important to provide financially than it is to build relationships with your family members. Vern was one of the happiest people that I've interviewed. Happy people talk freely about their passions. Happy people are in touch with their interests and they find ways to share those ideas and their related goals. I interviewed entrepreneur Dave Tuomisto, who has started four restaurants that have seen varying levels of success, from a seven-figure exit to a bank takeover. But regardless of the digits in his bank account, Dave's conversation is peppered with food talk. In fact, my first question to Dave I thought was a general question. I said, Dave, now what made you want to start a restaurant? He threw his head back and retorted, well, I think everyone would like to start a restaurant. And my response, I think everyone would want to start a magazine. We were both so passionate about, about our own chosen industries that we couldn't imagine anyone not wanting to do what we did, not feeling the same that we did. Dave's passion, his love about his chosen industry seasons all of his conversations. Happy people talk about their passions. Tom Homo has four Super Bowl rings, and he now oversees the athletic department at one of the nation's largest private universities. He builds his conversations around his passion for sports and morning walks. In fact, half of our interview took place on his morning walk down a river trail, because that's how I was going to get some time with him. He prefers to clear his mind and his schedule while he prepares for each day along that river trail. He believes strongly in connecting the body and the soul with nature, and he didn't hold back from talking about that. 
about talking about his love for morning strolls. Happy people talk about their passions. Second, happy people tell their own stories. Tom Holdman is the world's leading stained glass artist who's on a self-imposed deadline to finish Roots of Knowledge, which is an 80-panel university installation that details the history of knowledge with every glassy inch. Born with a speech impediment, Tom found art as a way to express his ideas, which now dot the globe in religious, academic, and community settings. His happiness is in full color, but also in his full conversation where he likes to tell the story of going door to door in the early days looking for customers. He also traveled around Europe, often sleeping in his car while he studied art. Potential clients, donors, and journalists line up to hear Tom gladly tell his story, even though it takes a little longer for him to express himself verbally. Happy people share the chapters of their lives as a way to connect to others. Another happy person I interviewed shared her story of creating music that now fills concert halls and is purchased for TV soundtracks. Mindy Gledhill's chapters include being cut from her high school choir and not making the school musical. But she wanted to write her own musical story, so she practiced by harmonizing with the horn on the family van and humming along with the microwave. Now Mindy drives a retro bus around the country as she schleps her vintage costumes and attracts music lovers who adore her whimsical style. Mindy's happiness, her stories, are toe-tapped across the country as she tells about herself through music and on social media. Her storyline is what attracts her fan base. Happy people tell their story. Third, happy people share lessons they've learned from setbacks that they've experienced. Blogger Stephanie Nielsen spent three months in a coma after a plane crash left burns on 80% of her body. It took a year before she posted a photo of her new brand of beauty. Her readers rallied around her. Oprah interviewed her. And now she's a best-selling author and speaker because of the happiness she radiates from the lessons she's learned about the importance of inner peace and the greatly exaggerated importance of outward appearances. Now she shares daily life on her daily blog and social media. Happy people talk about the lessons they've learned from their setbacks. I met Angel Murchison at the UN's Commission on the Status of Women in New York. Angel is as happy as her name sounds, but it's not because her life has been full of cloud jumping. Angel had an abortion in her teenage years and then faced emotional pain that plagued her for decades. Now she shares that experience with the international community, including policymakers who seek rights for women to have abortions, but may not realize the long-term ramifications that some women experience. Angel brings her smile and her story of healing to everyone she meets, including the listeners on her radio show. Sad stories don't have to lead to sad conversations. Sad stories can lead to lessons learned, which can lead to happy conversations. Fourth, happy people talk about what they are thankful for. I spent two days with Utah's first female Speaker of the House, Becky Lockhart, six months before she stepped down from office. Unfortunately, within a month of her political retirement at age 46, she passed away from a rare neurodegenerative brain disease. But she showed me her happy and her history so it could be preserved for the rest of us. One of her favorite topics was to tell me that as a young mother, she could not have been a legislator without her in-laws, who moved in with her family for eight weeks every year so she could focus on state politics. In her corner office as Speaker of the House, Becky also showed me a stack of quilts that she had made to give to fellow state leaders who had, had succeeded in their respective roles. Happy people talk about their gratitude for people and relationships. Tyler Glenn, the front man for Neon Trees, is more outgoing on stage than in media interviews, but his happy shone through. He expressed gratitude especially for his mother, and he says that everyone in the band likes to call his mom when there's good news because she turns it into the most exciting thing that has ever happened. He also praised her for signing him up for music lessons and dance lessons. His conversation was peppered with gratitude for his mom, and in addition, he expressed gratitude for the city of Provo, where the band got its start. Expressing gratitude is one of the best ways to showcase happiness. Fifth, happy people talk about ways they are taking care of themselves. 
Julie Diazavedo Hanks is regularly interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Cosmopolitan, and Psych Central. After discovering that the top reason women seek counseling is for depression, Julie wrote The Burnout Cure, and she labeled herself a self-care evangelist. This mother of four taught me that the formula of putting everyone else's needs above our own is not working. Happy people talk about ways they are honoring their needs to rest, to recreate, and to renew their own relationships. Happy people are not the busiest people who can tell you about their complicated schedule. Happy people take care of themselves, which in turn prepares them to more fully care for others. Again, happy people do not talk about their busy schedule, but they talk about the variety of ways they reward themselves along the way. In conclusion, this is what I know for sure about the happy people I've interviewed, knee to knee and smile to smile. Happy people talk, period. Relationships consistently rate as, an, as the most important asset for those near the end of their lives, for those planning their funerals. To truly build relationships, we must talk and share our passions, our stories, our dreams, our goals, and the ways that we're having fun. Happy people let others into their lives. I learned this myself when I interviewed Ann Romney. Our conversation started slow and then drastically improved when I opened my mouth. It was then that we connected about our common experiences planning summer events for youth and the challenges of each of us raising five children. In the beginning, I shared statistics about how often we smile, and I'll end by talking about smiling's cousin, laughter. What makes us laugh? 11% of the time, we laugh because of a joke. 17% of our giggles do come from the media. But a staggering 72% of our laughs come spontaneously from social interaction. We get our happy from each other. We must talk so we can smile and so we can laugh. Happiness is worth talking about. Thank you. <laughs>